Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to uh, have another of our webinars on the future of the island of Ireland with a particularly exciting and interesting speaker, Bertie Hearn, a Taoiseach of the Irish Republic, great uh, negotiator of the peace agreement, uh, one of the greatest political leaders of Ireland in the 20th century. Um, but my colleague Barry Koffer will introduce uh, the details of the procedure. Before we go into that, let me thank again uh, Sydney Sussex for co-hosting this event, and especially the Center for Geopolitics, which has been a faithful supporter over the past few months as we went through many successful meetings. Barry, over to you. Thanks very much, Eugenio, and good evening, everybody, or good afternoon, depending where you are. My name is Barry Colfer. I'm a research fellow in politics at St. Edmunds College at the University of Cambridge. And as Eugenio just set out, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this, our ninth meeting of the Cambridge Seminar Series on the future of the island of Ireland. Um, as always, I want to mention a handful of items of housekeeping. So we're delighted to be continuing the series over the coming months. And I'll provide details of some of our upcoming events at the end of the session. But next week already, I'm delighted that we're going to host Eileen Weir from the Shankill Women's Centre. who will be in conversation with Professor Bronwyn Walter. I'll share um, registration to her event, which is going to be on uniting people from the grassroots in a few moments. As always, we're going to finish inside an hour. So I'm going to introduce Bertie in a moment. and He'll speak for up to 10 minutes before a discussion with myself and my colleague, Lisa Claire Whitten, who I'm delighted is able to join us. Some of you have submitted questions already and the chat function is enabled, so please use it to submit further questions. We'll be looking at it for about the next 30 minutes and as always, we'll try and get through as many questions as we can in the short time that we have. As always, if you can, please keep questions concise and to the point as you can manage and please state your affiliation if you have one and if you feel it's relevant. So to introduce our speakers. Bertie Hearn was a member of Dublin City Council from 1978 until 1988 and was Lord Mayor of Dublin. But he was first elected to the Dáil, the lower house of the Irish Parliament in 1977 and served in a wide range of roles, including government chief whip, minister of state at the Department of the Taoiseach and at the Department of Defence, minister for labour in 1987, which oversaw the onset of Ireland's kind of keystone social partnership tradition, which obviously isn't around anymore, but he was there when it started. And he was appointed minister for finance on three separate occasions, Tónaiste, the minister for arts, culture and the Gaeltacht, Minister for Industry and Commerce at various stages. In 1994, Bertie was elected leader of the Fianna Fáil party and served as leader of the opposition until 1997, when he was first elected Taoiseach. He was re-elected in 2002 and 2007. This is a period of enormous social and economic transformation for Ireland, as many of you will know. The defining moment of Bertie's time in office, and indeed a defining moment in Irish history, was his contribution to the su successful negotiation of the Good Friday Agreement along with Tony Blair and the, and the political parties in Northern Ireland in April 1998. During his presidency of the European Council also in 2004, Bertie presided over the historic Eastern enlargement of the European Union. Since leaving government, Bertie has dedicated much of his time to conflict resolution. Bertie is one of the major figures of modern Irish politics. And certainly growing up myself in the 1990s, Bertie and the events he bore witness to were of enormous significance uh, for me personally and helped to kind of define modern Ireland in any number of ways. I'm really delighted that we're joined tonight by my, my colleague, Dr. Lisa Clare Whitten from Queen's University Belfast. Dr. Whitten is a research fellow at Queen's on the project Governance for a Place Between the Multi-Level Dynamics of Implementing the Protocol on Ireland slash Northern Ireland. So highly topical. Lisa Clare has a freshly minted PhD from Queen's where she wrote on Brexit and the Northern Ireland Constitution. And she's a rising star in this field. Prior to her research career, Lisa worked at the Office of the Northern Ireland Executive in Brussels and for a member of the UK Parliament in Westminster. As well as this, Lisa is a self-identified member of the ceasefire generation, uh, having grown up in post Good Friday Agreement in Belfast. And it's my real pleasure to be able to uh, share this event with you, Lisa. Thanks for being with us. As the panelists know the format, Bertie's going to speak for about 10 minutes before a conversation for 20 minutes with myself and Lisa. And during that time, Lisa is going to be good enough to be gathering up questions. We should have about 25 minutes at the end, as always, to go through them. Bertie, as always, thank you for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Barry, and delighted to, to join uh, Eugenio and, and uh, Lisa, and good to link up with you again. Um, 
Uh, time is tight and we want to get as much questions as, as we can, Barry. So I, I just, you know, want to run through a bit of the past quickly, a bit of the present, and then maybe in the questions we'll probably uh, talk about where, where we're going. But I suppose uh, Ireland is kind of known as a beautiful spot, a great home of writers and um, all kind of people of the arts that are world famous from George Bernard Shaw, James Joyce, Samuel Beckett, Oscar Wilde, and so many more. Um, but despite all th those great things about our, our country and all that good things that Yeats wrote, in terms of land of people and history on our beautiful island, uh, much has been uh, one of war and bloodshed and, and conflict and division, hatred, famine, immigration. Uh, and th this has been the past, unfortunately. Uh, if that was our history, I think much of the reason uh, for it had to do with our, our geography, small island, but highly strategically located uh, beside a much larger island and the edge of the great uh, continent of Europe uh, and pointing out across the mighty Atlantic to the new world of uh, the United States of America. Uh, I'm not going to go through our 800 years of history. You'd be glad to say we need about two days, but I'm going just to move quickly to the 1920s and the, the vision of the island in two uh, with the south, uh, where I come from, getting its independence, while the northeast of the island, today's Northern Ireland, remained, uh, as it still is, part of the United Kingdom. And that new uh, configuration uh, did not resolve the, the legacy of, of 800 years of history. Effectively, the uh, two parts of the island evolved in different directions. The south beset uh, by a civil war, uh, set about the task of building into a new viable and uh, independent state. It took several decades uh, for that process to be complete uh, and difficult decades as well. And, and in the meantime, in parallel, uh, the North experienced a very di different uh, and difficult trajectory. Um, tensions between the majority party, uh, largely Protestant, supportive of the Union uh, with Britain and the a minority community, largely Catholic, supported of a united Ireland remain um, high throughout the decades. And uh, the political uh, reality was that the power and influence rested largely with the unionist community, uh, with the Catholic, uh, the nationalist community having a, a strong sense of being uh, discriminated against uh, in its own land, while also uh, feeling cut off uh, from a new state so over the decades from the 1920s to the late 60s, jumping again 40 years, uh, the two jurisdictions of, of the island uh, had very little to do with each other. And despite being close neighbours, there was very little political contact. And relations between Dublin and Belfast were tense, they were hostile uh, in so far as they existed. And if this was bad, I think, enough, uh, matters were to become uh, distinctively worse in the late 60s, the old enmities of history uh, that had remained uh, bottled up uh, and uh, over the decades, the issues of partition, uh, which is 100 years old now, exploded and the civil rights movement was the catalyst of all of that. Uh, then we hit into the 30 years of, of troubles uh, and uh, everyone is very familiar with the death, the mayhem, the murder, the huge investment damages. So I just say we, we came right up till uh, 98, uh, where Tony Blair and I had the, the honor and the task of negotiating uh, the Good Friday Agreement, which was primarily to do three things. One, to stop the killing and the mayhem, uh, which I think has been um, by and large, uh, almost a total success. Uh, the second was try to set up new institutions where Northern Ireland would work uh, in, into the future. That's been up and down, sometimes successful, sometimes not. Um, and the third thing, I think, was to try to uh, bring people on the whole island of Ireland and uh, people together. Um, and that has been partially not, again, not totally. Um, uh, so, so that has been the, the kind of the past. The, the, present, uh, the present is um, Brexit aside, Bre Brexit has uh, not helped things, but uh, I don't want to uh, certainly answer the questions on Brexit, but I think the economy north and south is good. Uh, employment has in, in, in increased, cooperation has, a, has increased. Um, uh, there's far more that can be, that can be done. 
um, in, in, in my view, the great success um, of the economy in the South um, certainly um, can uh, be built on uh, so that the island economy is, is even stronger than it is today. Uh, business people are cooperating, farmers are cooperating, fishermen are cooperating, um, universities are, are working well uh, together, but there still are many gaps. If you ask me, were all the things of the vision of the Good Friday Agreement, are they implemented or near implemented? There still are significant gaps. Uh, we still have you know, separate education systems. We don't, don't um, we still have uh, sectarianism, um, maybe not much violence, but still a, a lot of enmity. Uh, the legacies of the past are still an outstanding issue, unfortunately. Um, uh, and and these, are, these are challenges. Um, but I suppose I, I should say the, the, it's not all negative. Uh, the economy as north and south is emerging from COVID. Uh, the first half of this year has seen the uh, export uh, engine of the Irish economy, north and south, uh, continue to, uh, to thrive and work to a level of normality. Uh, we're now returning to, I think, a strong domestic economy. Uh, and we're seeing that uh, COVID payments, though very tough on the national finances that have been all over the world, uh, have not um, really created uh, horrendous difficulties. Um, we, we have some uh, obvious uh, long-standing uh, international um, deficits, uh, significant uh, government policy uh, commitments that have to be dealt with. Our health system uh, is still not at the, the level uh, that I would like to see it. Uh, we have uh, still problems with pension deficit. We've infrastructure deficits, though our infrastructure is far better. But we're still a, a location of huge international investment in spite of the tax changes that are pending, which I don't think will do too much damage. Uh, and we are seeing greater uh, cooperation um, uh, between uh, the whole island economy. Uh, so um, I, I think, Barry, we, we can look with a, a, a certain uh, satisfaction if we were to look back as we are this year in the historical context, 100 years since uh, the Government of Ireland Act, 100 years uh, since partition, uh, It's not just me who's lost Bertie, is it? No, right. he has frozen there. Could not bother. Thanks, Philip. I'm sure Bertie will be back with his post haste. Indeed. So, just Lisa and Eugenio, whilst I'm sure Bertie will have to reappear uh, at some point in the next few moments, but any impressions on any of any of what Bertie said up to, up to this point? Yeah, he's gone. Any questions or any, any thoughts? Please, you've only had a couple of minutes. You, I, Daniel, what I would like to ask him when he comes back is the significance and the role of leadership mm -hmm. in bringing about the progress, which undoubtedly there has been you know, much progress all along the line, as he said, but also now at this juncture in mapping, so to speak, the way forward in deciding how precisely we can move from here forward in a way that without further unsettling mm -hmm. the relations between North and South and between East and West, mm -hmm. they help to consolidate the achievements and, the, and, the, and what has been done to, to push forward the peace progress. Mm. Good, yeah. Lisa, what do you reckon? I have something to, something to say about leadership as well, but I'm actually gonna to write to Bertie. So if you have mm. any, and say Lisa. Yeah, I guess not unrelatedly, um, I'm quite interested in his perspective on British-Irish diplomatic relations today. Um, he mentioned just the close working with um, UK Prime Minister Tony Blair and the, he was drawing that um, wonderful kind of historical perspective to the, see the change in um, British-Irish relations when we're moving towards uh, the ceasefires and the peace process. So. Um, I think it would be interesting to ask for his assessment of British-Irish diplomacy um, and the interaction that that has with 
particularly political stability here in Northern Ireland, um, because of the challenges that we've seen in the last few years. Do you, do you understand them to be kind of changing to an important degree, do you say? Mm. I would suggest, yes, that I guess what one of the things that Brexit has done is created um, a scenario whereby the UK government and the Irish government are on different, um, have different positions towards a key issue that's affecting Northern Ireland. Um, and that hasn't really happened since, I guess, 1993. Mm. Um, and so that navigating that, that's not to, to be necessarily um, doom and gloom about it, but it's a new challenge for post, post agreement, post conflict, maybe even moving to post post conflict um, mm -hmm. as to Lisa, how. You... Lisa, you are a specialist on constitution, the constitutional development in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been talking a lot about referendums, particularly with reference, of course, to the, the future of the island. But I was wondering, is there any uh, space for a referendum about the constitutional settlement of uh, the uh, protocol, whether or not the people of Northern Ireland, apart from Downing Street, apart from Dublin, and everybody else, what do they think of it? Mm. It's interesting. It came up in the, the debates towards the latter stage um, when Boris Johnson came into office. Mm -hmm. Um, so under Article 18 of the protocol, there is an innovative provision that allows for votes in the Northern Ireland Assembly um, every four years or eight years recurring um, on the application of, it's not the whole protocol, but it's um, Articles 5 to 10, um, the, the trade aspects of the protocol. Uh, so I think there's... There's something interesting to note in that um, it's a, a consent style vote, um, like a legislative consent motion, almost that idea in reverse. So it's not quite a referendum. It's not quite popular consent, but it is an acknowledgement, um, a kind of parliamentary consent, an acknowledgement that the protocol is very significant. It was an attempt by the UK government um, to provide a kind of Northern Irish um, you would have to say uh, infrequent, um, but input um, as to whether or not they did consent to it. It's not uncontroversial, I um, would also say that, uh, but it also means that this issue of the protocol and post-Brexit Northern Ireland governance, that this these questions are likely to be recurring um, because this consent, these consent votes come up um, every four to eight years uh, we perhaps have Bertie returning. Yes, indeed. I, I kind of wanted to hear, hear the end of that thought, Lisa, so I'll have to come back to it. Perhaps. Mm. Happy to. <laughs> Could talk about that all evening. You'd have to stop me. <laughs> Good. Well, that's be a future event in the series. <laughs> Whilst Bertie is connecting, this is a silly question, but is there is there precedent other than the obvious for referendums that just took place in Northern Ireland, Lisa? I can't think, other than the Good Friday Agreement, has there ever been one? There was one in 1975, um, but it was mostly boycotted mm. by one section of the community. Ah, yes. it was, um, so it was kind of not seen as legitimate. Mm. Um, then the only other referendum was on e-membership. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah good. So, so, I thought, so there isn't the same tradition as there is in a you know, public hold referendum. And I, I apologise if there's historians who I don't think I've forgotten. Major sure, someone would chip in if you forgot something. Yes, indeed. Feel free we, our colleagues in UCL are doing great work on the, um, on, the on the prospect on the, the referendum commission at the constitution unit there. I'm sure yes. if someone's here and if we have misspoken, I'm sure they contribute. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There was obviously 2016 as well, which I yes, wasn't. Of course. Yeah. I would, there is growing discussion around um, use of citizens' assemblies here. The prospect of citizens' assemblies has been involved in some early conversations around that. Um, and it is kind of modelling off uh, the Irish example that is so very well developed and quite unique in that respect. Um, Indeed, and seemingly very highly regarded as well just from, from experts in that field. What sort of stuff do you have? We got Bertie. We have Bertie. Brilliant. Awesome. What sort of topics will be in the in, in the mix for citizens assemblies, do you think? 
Well, we've um, there have been some pilot ones run on the question, the border poll question. Mm. Um, there's there was also one on a reform of health and social care. Um, I believe so. Uh, some colleagues at Queen's are attempting to get them very mainstream. Um, Fantastic! I watch with great interest. Bertie, have we got you on your phone there? Can you hear us? I'm pretty sure that's Bertie. I think it is. It's perhaps. <laughs> I'm sure it's it's extremely stressful when that happens. So. I know. There's a wall there. I'd say we'll give this maybe if if the both of you consent, we'll maybe give it another minute or two because we don't want to keep uh, we have a big crowd actually, but we don't want to keep um, people from the evening if we're not going to be able to do the event. So maybe if I was twenty one, we'll wait for two or three minutes further. Daniel, what do you think? Yes, unless you want to continue the three of us, Lisa is much to say. You could uh, summarize for us some of your findings and some of your research. I'd, I'd be thrilled to, I mean, we still have Bertie coming and going, I'd be thrilled to do that. And obviously we wouldn't be offended if people chose to leave, but I mean, that's us putting Lisa on the spot a little bit. If you're happy, Lisa. Um, yeah, I can try to remember. Is, is Bertie perhaps in the room? I think he is, but I think there's, sorry to speak over you, Daniel. I think there's persistent audio matters where he's connecting to audio, but doesn't quite. Let's see. Bertie, are you there? Yeah, I, I've, I've got you on my phone. There, unfortunately, there's been a power cut here, so I don't know what happened. <laughs> That's uh, Gosh. the energy crisis it, has reached Dublin. It, it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not my house, I'm glad to say. It's the neighbourhood. So, um, so I'm, I'm back on phone. Sorry about that. On the slightest note, uh, needless to say, between Lisa, Lisa Clare, Eugenio and myself, we were able to sustain a, uh, an enjoyable conversation. So, so don't be worrying at all. Um, do you want to kind of finish off the thoughts you you're having and then we can start having a bit of a chat if you're if you're happy no no let's move into the chat because we've taken the time fantastic okay so one of the things Bertie that I was interested in hearing more about you touched upon it in your intervention I'm, I'm going to maybe say two or three things to you and then, then hand over to, to, to Lisa Clare in the interest of time the current state of UK Irish relations uh, I'm sure we can kind of preempt some, some of the things you'd say but in your own words uh, why are they different now compared to the 90s? Uh, I know we've spoken before you and I and also Eugenio mentioned about the importance of leadership and personality. We are really interested to know if you've anything to say about that, about why they're different. And then relatedly, and this is kind of betraying my own interests, um, how important was EU membership back in the 90s for like those habits of cooperation between the two sides in the lead up to and the successful ex uh, the completion of the Good Friday Agreement negotiations? Could you comment on both of those, Bertie? Yeah, maybe I'll just take the second one first. Um, I think the relationship from 1973 uh, between the Irish government and the British government improved radically from uh, you know, the earlier decades. Mm -hmm. uh, they were working together uh, on most issues. Uh, and because of the common law legal system, the relationship between um, us was you know, fairly compatible on, on most of the key issues. Um, on the single market and, um, you know, free trade and uh, justice and home affairs issues, like the big issues of the day. Um, the, the governments worked well together. And I think the officials at civil service level um, had a really good relationship and the legal officers had a good relationship. So, you know, and we, we did take tact on, on most issues. We, we cooperated um, across issues when there were rows pending um, I think Ireland tended to, you know, to try to uh, keep a well-balanced position and vice versa. So I think that was, um, so then that continued on. The sad thing about Brexit, without, you know, gilding the lily too much, but the sad thing was that, you know, now the Irish officials at civil service level, junior level, middle ranking level, senior level, they don't meet anymore. Uh, that all ended. And those kind of personal dynamics and, you know, having a drink and having a cup of coffee and maybe going for a walk and chatting, you know, and exchanging notes privately and all of that at civil service level ended. And the, the, the kind of the way we knew British politicians so well, that that's ended too. 
that maybe hasn't become a big issue yet, but I think as years go on, it will become a, mm-hmm. a big issue. So I think that's a, that's very sad. Um, on, under successive governments, um, well, it take more recent times, Tony Blair, um, you, you know, Brown, Cameron, uh, you know, the, the relationships continue to be, to be very good. Under Theresa May, um, while Brexit had happened and there was arguments about the withdrawal agreement and arguments about the backstop and that, I think there were cordial and um, people were able to have differences of opinion, exchange drafts and generally work together. Uh, unfortunately, um, in, in more recent times, um, uh, things have gone uh, down the tubes, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, I think Michael Go, while he was handling the brief, um, it, things were okay. Uh, and there was a good exchange. He had a good relationship with the European negotiators. And by extension, though he may not have been the, the most favourite person in Ireland always because of his view sometimes on Northern Ireland, but I think the, he, he was building up a good relationship and a, a, a good spirit. But from the day he left uh, and, and, and um, Lord Frost came in, uh, I think it's true to say that things have got bad. Um, they like it's it's only two years since they negotiated the the, the protocol. Uh, you you now hear Lord Frost speak as if he'd nothing to do with the protocol that he never heard about it. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid with, without without going on too much about it, um, relationships are strained. As late as last week, we had the tarnished the deputy prime minister um, saying that he. You know, how would anyone around the world trust uh, the British government if they treat them the same as they've treated us with the protocol? So, you know, maybe that's a bit strong, but you, you, it gives you a sense of, 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 of how things have badly deteriorated in the last few years. Yeah, thanks. And actually, I'm going to really um, kind of test Lisa Witten's um, capacity to multitask in a sec, because Lisa, you, you might in a sec want to ask something about diplomacy, because we were just talking about it whilst, whilst Bertie was away from us. But Bertie, just to push you a, a final time, c- compared to the 90s, perhaps you, you, you don't want to say any more, but, you know, there was great figures around you back in back in the 90s. There was yourself, there was Blair, there was Trimble, there was Hume, there was many kind of big, big characters from their communities. Um, do you see the same figures emerging in the similar context today, or is that just an area of difference compared to the 90s? Well, I, I, I suppose you can imagine the answer I'd give because now I'm older and I think all the guys that were old with me are all great. But um, but I think it is true to say that we, we were, were, in one way, we were very lucky to have the quality of people like John Hume, Seamus Mallon, even on the loyal side, Davey Irvine, um, you know, Manny McWilliams, the leader of the, the, the Women's Coalition and some of the other women in the coalition. Mo Mola um, as well, of course. And, and Mo Mola. Like, I think there were, there were a generation of people and, you know, maybe the, the criticism of us all was maybe we, we were too much on the peace process in Northern Ireland. But I think as political individuals um, and skillful individuals, uh, leave myself totally out of it, um, I think there were there were a generation of people that had been around from, you know, the, the 60s, late 60s, maybe uh, through the 70s, 80s, 90s. And there were a skill group. And I think they proved that like there were strong um, politicians in, in, in Europe. There were strong politicians elsewhere. And of course, yeah, Ian Paisley, Reverend Ian Paisley was a formidable political person, got the highest vote of any politician anywhere in Europe and European elections, quarter of a million votes. So, you know, they, 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 these were formidable characters, whether you agreed with them or disagreed with them. Absolutely, well, well put Bertie. Lisa, you can, you can sidestep it if you want, but just seeing as we're discussing the kind of changing nature of Irish UK diplomatic relations, do you want to ask Bertie Enton because you're kind of approaching that area? I was, yeah, thank you, Barry and um, Bertie. Just as by way of follow up, on what you've already um, outlined about British-Irish diplomatic relations, I guess um, I would have a question around your perspective on the impact that that could have on Northern Ireland or has had on Northern Ireland's political stability, just because that has been in the course of the peace process, British-Irish um, kind of shared positions on Northern Ireland issues was quite was really significant. 
um, particularly in those early days. So uh, any reflections you have on that and perhaps um, kind of dovetailing that, do you think that change in relations that's happened quite recently, how long term do you think that is or its impacts and implications could be? Yeah, I, I think the the whole diplomacy, as you know, Lisa, you, you're, you're, you're an expert in this field, but I mean, it is it is important. I, I mean, it's, you know, where people can have differences, significant differences, historical differences, you know, cultural differences, whatever, um, but are able to uh, articulate um, their case in, in a, in a civilised manner. Um, and I suppose the big issue in this is the trust. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if there's trust and people uh, see people as, as fair play players, um, I mean, I, I can speak myself with, uh, with both Tony Baron, Gordon Brown, uh, and I know later on with, with Brian Cowan, with, uh, with Prime Minister Cameron um, and Gordon Brown. Like there, there, were, there were people who they stated the position, they, they gave it as it was, and it, it wasn't a question of getting agreement and everything that wasn't feasible or proper. But um, it, it's, it's when the trust goes where people, you know, it, it becomes into, into mirror and, and, and daggers. Um, that's the unhelpful bit. And I, 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 that's what worries me. Um, and I don't like the rhetoric of, you know, when we, when we all start, whether it's the Irish side or the British side, when we start just having a go at each other, because it normally doesn't get you anywhere. And tomorrow you have to go back and be a diplomat again and, and deal with it. So, so I, I, I think it is fair to say, Lisa, that mm -hmm. the Brexit vote um, mm -hmm. has, has, Ireland was not considered uh, part of the equation. Uh, even though people here, we try to speak about it, like there were far bigger issues. And I understand that. I understand that. And I understand that immigration and these were the big issues of the day and, you know, uh, it being taken over by Europe and Europe having too much of a say. So I think for the last five years, we've been on a downward slope. Now, to answer your question, can that be turned around? And I think this is where uh, we, we have to wait and, and see. But there is a feeling in the Republic of Ireland, and maybe to a lesser extent, as you know, in Northern Ireland, that the, the, the Prime Minister Boris doesn't really care to hoots about us. And, and you know, um, that he's too many other things on his plate and that we're really small fry. And, you know, um, it, that, that's a problem because when, like I was over to Westminster number 10, I've got, I was in number 10 more times probably than any, than any Irish teacher over the years. But, you know, and I genuinely trust this, the officials and, you know, if Alistair Campbell, John or certain Powell or the other key guys or any of the officials, we, we, we knew what they were saying. And when they said they couldn't do something, they couldn't do it. And, you know, it was no good dancing up and down. Um, now, now there's a, a deep sense of, of mistrust and that's going to take a bit of time. Uh, and of course, it takes both sides, takes two to to, to dance, you know, so it's, it's uh, um, I, I think I'm not, I'm not putting all the blame in one place. That's, that's not, that's not fair, but it is a big problem. It's really interesting that that's what you focus on, Bertie, because if for, for anyone who reads the kind of the memoirs, the likes of Jonathan Powell's memoirs from, from that time and, and all the other contributions that this sense of, of trust, you know, that even if you, you may not like each other, I'm sure many people didn't like each other, but there was a sense of kind of trust and respect. that just doesn't really seem to be with us today, but, I want to move on rather briskly, right? I'm conscious both that there's lots of good questions come in. And what I'm going to propose is the following. Uh, there's one or two questions, if we have time at the very end, I'll put to Bertie because it's a slightly different tack. It pertains to Ireland and Europe. But for now, what I want to do is, first of all, just see if Eugenio is anything he wants to ask briefly. Then hand over to Lisa to see if you have any further questions, Lisa. And then we're going to get through to the Q&A. And then if we get through enough of those, then we'll come back to me to ask a couple, couple of questions regarding Ireland's place in Europe, if we're happy. So Eugenio, do you want to say anything? As always, you don't have to. Very briefly, Probably will. Very briefly Bertie. Uh, there's an issue which I raised already with Lisa, and she gave an enlightening answer, but I would like to know what you think. Since the um, protocol is now becoming the, the source and the focus of endless discussions, would there be not uh, have a point in calling a referendum on the protocol itself, whether the uh, what is what is an offer right now with the counter offers from the European Union? is satisfactory from the point of view 
of the people of Northern Ireland? Well, I, I think my, my worry about that is it, it would become a, a referendum um, of what the political parties say on one side and what the political parties say on the other. So it, again, we might get back to a, uh, to a headcount, um, which, which mightn't be on the issue. Um, and, and that my, my, my worry would be. But the, the other problem is um, the protocol has now changed and the substance of the protocol has changed so many times. Uh, the core issue is still there. And the, the core issue is to avoid a land border on the island of Ireland. Uh, and everybody is in agreement with that. But it's when we get into all of the, the detail. And I think in fairness to the European Union, um, and I suppose this is, this is, they've changed their position. They genuinely came over, listened to the business people, listened to the community people. And what they did last week was to try to simplify what was very complicated. And I think, you know, that was a victory in, in, in many ways for the politicians in the North who said the, the protocol was unworkable. So I think we now probably have a protocol that will be more workable if, if we ever get around to it. Um, but I, I think putting it to the people would probably be, uh, um, I'd be afraid we, 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 we'd get into an unholy row, which mightn't be uh, the best. Sorry, Anthony Alcy Junio. Nope, you're, you're muted there, I think. I think we should proceed with the other questions now. Indeed, thanks so much, Junio. Lisa, so please, you, a couple, couple of minutes, you have questions for Bertie, and then we'll, we'll jump straight into the abundant questions and answers we have. Questions we have, yeah, answers, please. Lisa. Um, yeah, so actually, I mean, I could um, ask you questions on these issues all night, so I think I might um, just jump forward with some of the uh, key questions we've got in on the chat, Bertie, if that's okay. Sure. Um, to start with, uh, a bit of a reflective um, I'm kind of blending two here, but just on the Good Friday Agreement, um, I've had a question in to ask if you think the Good Friday Agreement has been uh, successful and or if you um, could, uh, in a different um, world and time, would you change anything about the Good Friday Agreement and its substance? Um, yeah, can I ask you this? Yeah, I think the Good Friday Agreement, I mean, it, 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 it pushed a whole lot of, issues together. I mean, the view that Tony Blair and I took was that it should be as comprehensive uh, and as, you know, multifaceted as possible, rather than take the small number of items, we went for a large number of items. And when you look at the release of prisoners on license, uh, criminal justice change, um, Equality Act, the Ombudsman legislation, the reform of policing, uh, <coughs> setting up um, new institutions, the executive, the assembly, uh, north south bodies you know I, th I think all of these things have been you know not perfect but certainly uh, you know a, a very good issue we <coughs> we probably made some mistakes i think the whole area of the decommissioning of arms the way we we dealt with it it went on from 1998 to 2007 it became a long playing record and um, then the, we should have been able to do that a better way and it caused a lot of political casualties along the way and caused a lot of trouble for, for David Trimble, um, which I, I regret that um, the, the way that was handled. Um, sectarianism, uh, how, how, have, we, how, have we got anywhere near the, the end of, of, of that or there the legacy issues which are still there, even though we came to an agreement several years ago called the Stormont House Agreement on it, uh, there's been no progress on that. So I think the Good Friday Agreement in terms of peace, um, stability, you know, the economy doing well, investment doing well, tourism doing well. Yes, very successful. Uh, some of the old issues of, of legacy, um, educational systems, um, not so good. As one who has been a direct beneficiary of that piece, uh, imperfect as it is, I would I would agree with you uh, wholeheartedly. Barry, I think you have a question. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. I'll just I'll put I'll put two questions from the chat. I think just to uh, to um, in the interest of time. So, Bertie, the, the first question comes from uh, Professor Mary Daly from from UCD, who's joining us. Mary, it's good you can be with us. Um, it's kind of building on what you discussed with Lisa a little bit. Um, and Bertie is with us, even though it looks like it's just a darkened room. Um, 
Mary asks, my sense is that the Irish government never developed a close relationship with the Northern Ireland office, preferring to work either with Westminster or Northern Ireland politicians. Would Bertie agree? And then separately, but not entirely unrelated, Bertie, just to bring it up to the present day and one of our many controversies, which actually we haven't touched upon yet, Jack Power, who's joining us from the Irish Times, has asked, does Mr. Hearn feel that President Michael D. Higgins was correct to not attend the event organized to commemorate the formation of Northern Ireland and partition of the country in Armagh? And does he feel the government of Fianna Fáil are right to send a representative to the ceremony? Two different questions, Bertie, do your best. Yeah, well, well, Mary Daly I think, is, is right. Um, the, the relationship between our civil service and NIO was never great. Uh, the relationship between, in my generation of politicians, and the NIO was, was kind of, we, we dealt with number 10 um, rather than Northern Ireland. So Mary is correct on that. Um, and the North-South bodies, when they're operational, have improved that um, a good deal. But I have to say, I, since I'm out of North-South bodies, I, what I hear is that it, it has improved it, but I don't have first-hand experience of that. So I'd have to say Mary is correct. The second question I have kept totally out of that um, I think every news paper and everybody else has asked me that uh, question about the president uh, and I haven't got uh, in, involved in the issue. Uh, I, and what, the only way I've answered it, uh, uh, which isn't a direct answer, and I'm not going to give a direct answer, but my only answer is that when, when, when I was uh, Taoiseach, um, I got the Irish taxpayer to pay for the Battle of the Boyne site. I worked with um, the orange um, orange uh, community in the north to design the Battle of the Bind site. Um, I worked with Reverend Paisley and all of the maps from all of the orange museums in the north. Um, I thought that was a good act of reconciliation, which uh, people agreed with. Um, back in 1999, I held uh, a state reception, the first one ever uh, on the, with the Dublin Fusiliers, bringing people from the, uh, from the war uh, areas together. I think these acts of re reconciliation, um, and of course there was always criticism of these issues, not that much um, to be frank with you, um, but I think these acts of re reconciliations are, are very important. And um, I, I support uh, anyone holding out the hand of friendship because I understand loyalism, I understand unionism, that they do feel um, that you know we, we don't love them enough. So I think whenever we can, we can help, we should. Over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Bertie. Yeah, that's that's great, Bertie. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions come in from the audience that, that are both kind of future facing, um, one for the north and one for the south. Uh, the first just around the protocol and the current UK EU talks, um, the uh, next round of UK EU talks. Do you think it's possible for an agreement on the protocol to come that will satisfy um, not just UK and EU, but uh, both sides in Northern Ireland? And then the second. I, I, yeah, oh, yeah, I, I, Go I do, one. Lisa, on that one. I, I, I think it's, um, uh, I, I think it is possible. A lot of progress has been made, and I think if there's goodwill, uh, if there's, and I think there, there will be sincere effort uh, mm -hmm. by, um, by Marcus Kovic. Um, uh, I hope the same from Lord Fossey. He said he will. So I think if they really uh, knuckle down to this, they can. They, they can find a, a solution. I, I can tell you this because I spent Saturday, as I was saying to you before we started, I spent Saturday with a substantial group of, of you. technical difficulties again there. Ongoing technical difficulties and he's in full flow, it's such a shame. No. Can you hear us okay, Bertie? Are you there? Oh. Not with, might not be. Anything to say about what, what how Bertie has responded to your questions, Lisa? I appreciate his hopeful response. Mm -hmm. um, I would agree that a landing zone is can be seen. Um, there we go. Uh, 
I think there is a landing zone, um, to use an a awful cliche phrase, but uh, between the UK and EU positions. I think the more difficult question is how that can be um, uh, sold in the Northern Ireland political um, debate, which you would have to acknowledge on the protocol is really, it's really quite toxic um, and it has gotten uh, quite divisive. But I think um, in my most hopeful moments that uh, the unionist leadership are aware that uh, the protocol isn't um, isn't really going to go anywhere. Um, and so there is a need to, to start to think pragmatically about how um, this new post-Brexit arrangement can be made to work. Um, and I think there is an appetite for that. But the, the difficult question is the political and the, the kind of narrative um, that Bertie had touched on previously, yeah. this, this very real sense of, of betrayal and abandonment. Um, that is not unfounded uh, and that that's the most difficult problem to solve and I'm not sure that um, I would say I'm not sure that I've yet seen uh, the kind of leadership necessary um, to to kind of assuage that um, so we could get a pragmatic agreement um, the political outworkings of it I think will take longer let me ask you let me let me point of push, push back on one thing you said there. I'd suggest you wait another just give Bertie one more chance to join because I'm I'm kind of really interested to hear what he says to a few more of the questions we have stored stored up. So if people can be good enough to you know, bear with us for two three minutes. And yeah. um, do you really believe that Lisa that the unionist leaders don't actually believe that the leaders of unionism you refer to actually believe that the protocol isn't going to go anywhere and it's just kind of part of a wider political program? Do you actually believe that we have? We have Doug Beattie on the 6th of December, uh, quick um, quick mention of that, and we have Jeffrey Donaldson to be scheduled, so I'll ask them the same questions. You really believe that? They think it's 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 around, they just need to kind of challenge it for some reason or other? Um, so uh, I, I'll correct what I said. I mm. think um, the Unionist leaders realise that particular arrangements, that Northern Ireland needs a protocol type arrangement. Yeah. Um, I think they are divided internally and across the, the spectrum as to what that, um, how close that can uh, be to the current protocol that we have. Um, so the extent of change required. Um, the, to be honest, I myself go back and forth as to how much they realize that they can or um, ought to get rid of the protocol. Um, the, the truth is that in this context, Northern Ireland actors, Northern Ireland politicians, their power to change it is political um, and limited. It's at the behest of the UK government. And so they don't really have um, a direct role in renegotiating or changing. Um, and I do think, I do think they're aware of that, um, which is part of why the rhetoric is so strong. Um, I think there's often and throughout history, there has been more pragmatism um, in Northern Ireland politics than uh, the language used um, ever really would suggest. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's, so I, it's maybe an optimistic reading, but I think I think there is a more shared ground and awareness of, of the fact that this protocol um, or something like this protocol is required and is, is not going anywhere. Anyway, yeah. I'm going to, in a sec, ask you, Eugenio, if you if you've anything you want to ask. I mean, we're really we're really um, I mean, exaggerating um, Lisa's good nature here. That Lisa was meant to be here for uh, just just to assist and ask a few questions, and you know, central to events. I want to ask you one thing, Lisa. We've had uh, this is our ninth meeting, I think I said, and I have to be honest. Some of the other meetings that we've had, I won't think of, I won't mention particular ones, but they haven't left me with a huge amount of hope. To, to be quite frank, I mean, they've been really, really interesting and really thorough and there's elements of hope, but there's also so much to be kind of apprehensive about. Yeah. And actually Bertie obviously is coming from a very different perspective, but he'd kind of be feeling a bit more hopeful, but I guess that's based on his own experiences of the 90s. Something that I've always wondered, most of the people we have are of a certain age, they're older than me, they're older than you. Mm. So to what extent can you, can you talk a little bit about like how much does the generational shift really matter because it's, it's like, for me, it's something that I haven't really been able to get out of this series yet because you haven't had that many young speakers. So 
To what extent do you think it's different if you're born in the 90s, the 80s, the 70s or whatnot? Or even sooner, of course. Hmm. I think it's it's a difficult question to, or it's a difficult kind of um, thing to quantify the extent of intergenerational difference. However, um, I am very hopeful when I think about the future of Northern Ireland. And part of that is based on, um, if you look at the way people identify here, and we are, we're too into um, political demographics and head counting, um, I would see that definitely. Um, but the, the growing population, growing um, kind of category in the population are those who do, don't identify as unionist or nationalist um, in a very strong degree. They may vote unionist or nationalist, but it's not at their kind of core identity. Um, and that has a very clear uh, generational um, trend to that. So, so younger generations are much, much more likely to identify as neither unionist or nationalist. Um, that in itself, I think, gives me hope. And that's not to say that it's a bad thing to identify as unionist or nationalist, mm -hmm. but for it to be your, um, uh, our conflict was based on fear of um, those identities being, uh, there being no room for them, a kind of mutual fear. Um, and the more that that space can be opened up and a kind of more multiplicity of identities mm. allowed and facilitated in our society, then the easier it is to, to start to talk about um, quote unquote normal um, political societal issues that are you know, the health service, our economy, um, infrastructure, the environment, and more and more. Um, and again, a silver lining of um, Northern Ireland's really starring role in Brexit. I would suggest has been a forced focus on some of those more traditional, normal, pragmatic issues. So we've had to learn what our supply lines are like. We've had to realize the, the nature of North-South cooperation, not as a political issue, but as a real like life affecting issue, day to day and um, politics issues. And so that gives me hope too, that as we have to work out these really outstanding, difficult questions, um, um, the, the symbolism and the identity questions and the politics of fear, all of that is still present, but there is this new dynamic and a kind of strong momentum behind working out how we do life well together, not from a place of fear, but from a place of, of normal kind of people living together and um, collective uh, things. So ultimately I am, I am hopeful. Um, it's, it's never, uh, it's a dangerous thing to make any predictions in politics, but awesome. I'm hopeful. Yeah, I, I'd say I'm, I'm hopeful after that as well, Lisa. That was, that was a lovely intervention. Eugenio, please. And then I guess we'll wrap up then, because I don't think we'll get for What Elizabeth so elegantly yeah. said. Yes, the, the, the issue, or one way forward in, in dealing with these issues, it would be to separate, to distinguish completely the question of identity from the question of the specific negotiations around the position of Ireland and Northern Ireland within the European um, uh, Union and Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom, and the way in which this position can be negotiated in such a way to serve the economic interests and then the political identity or the abstract issue of sovereignty, which have been dominating the debate so far. And that is precisely the point, separating politics from the practicalities of how to run the economy for the interests of the people on the ground, the, people, the community in Northern Ireland. If this could be done, and I think it can be done in, in theory and technically, then many of the other questions will become much more tractable. I'm just putting a link to our next meeting in the chat here. Uh, like I said, I would do it. We've got Eileen Weir from the Shanka Women's Centre next Monday, which I think is going to be a brilliant event. And it's a really, really important part of, of the rich tapestry of life in any community that Shankill can, that's, um, Shankill, that Eileen can speak with such fluency. So I do encourage you to join us. I was really looking forward to asking Bertie, there was a question from Garth Fitzgerald about um, to what degree Bertie thinks the Biden administration will trim the sales of uh, Boris and Frost for the British government as, as they damage the Good Friday Agreement. I think that's a really, really important area of discussion. We're working hard to put together a panel of US Congress people 
we have US Congress people who will speak with us in the new year. It's just a case of pinning down a time. So watch that space. I was also really interested. There was another question. Obviously, I just I'd love to hear Bertie reflect on whether he believes there will be United Ireland in his lifetime, because you always like to ask people that and see what they do. Um, and I was keen to talk to Bertie about kind of the future of Europe, the recent changes in Ireland's corporate tax regime, Ireland kind of moving ever closer to its, you know, Ireland being the most enthusiastic member of the EU historically. Is wondering what kind of is the future of the EU, but we're backsliding in certain parts of the bloc and the challenges pertaining to COVID, migration and whatnot, because, you know, as well as Bertie's important role in, in, in Irish history, he was also a kind of an important figure in recent European history and European politics. So I guess I might try and get him to do this another time. Um, and I, I guess, I mean, we're up against the clock anyway. So I guess, Lisa and Eugenio, for me, it's been a pleasure talking to both of you and also to Bertie to an extent. Really, really appreciate Lisa joining us and doing such a, an excellent job. As I said, Lisa was initially going to help me out with the Q&A and ended up being the, the main event. So for those of you who don't know Lisa Clare Witt, and here you are, she's a rising star research fellow um, at Queen's University of Belfast. I'm sure we're all going to hear much more uh, from her. So unless, Eugenio, if you just want to bring it officially to a close and yeah. apologize to the audience and hopefully see you. Final word, we have Eileen next week and the week after that, we have Lord Robin Eames. I'll also share the re registration form for that always Mondays at six o'clock. So hopefully you can be with us again. Thanks everybody and apologies for the disruption. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to be here. Thanks guys. I'll just quickly share the link to Robin Eames and then I will close because the chat function then dies obviously with the room. So let me do this quickly in case anybody's interested. We still have a full house. Um, there you go. That's Lord Robin Eames in two weeks and Eileen Weir in one week. I guess I'll bring it to a close with that. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.